In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you why great swords are the best weapon in Elden Ring. This is the first video of our new series where we go through each weapon type and show you what you can do with each weapon and why you may or may not use those weapons in your build. In this video, we're going to be showing you each of the movesets of the different 21 great swords in the game, as well as their weapon skills, and talking about the pros and cons of each of these great swords, helping you to make a decision as to whether or not it's something you want to use in your build. Before we get into each weapon though, the first thing I want to talk about is greatsword styles of play. In my opinion, there are really three different styles of play available to the greatsword, and these are jump attack, power stanced, using a weapon skill with either a single greatsword or using a single greatsword and shield, and using that weapon skill or using a block counter playstyle, or playing as a spell blade where you're using a greatsword in one hand and a staff or seal in the other. When selecting a great sword, you really need to identify which style of play you want to use with these. In my opinion, out of the three, Jump Attack Power Stance is probably the easiest to play and it's extremely powerful. Behind it is probably the Spell Blade in terms of what you can do because you have spells at your disposal. In terms of things you can do, you have more in your arsenal with ranged and melee attacks. And probably the last one is using some sort of weapon skill or a block counter build that also uses a weapon skill. As far as the pros and cons go of great swords in general, they have very high single attack damage, and they can be power stanced more easily than colossal weapons due to lower weight, and they generally have very low requirements that can be two-handed very easily in most cases. However, they have lower DPS than some weapons due to their slower swings, and they have higher stamina consumption than some weapons, and many of them are not found until much later in the game, making it difficult to make the build you want early on. So jumping into the great swords themselves, the first up is Alabaster Lord Sword. This weapon shares the default moveset of many other great swords and deals both physical and magic damage, and it is the lightest great sword in Elden Ring Wing 8, and requires some points in strength and dexterity and intelligence in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it has the highest physical damage of all magic or cold infused great swords, as well as unique great swords that deal magic damage. It deals plus 20% damage to gravity type enemies. These are enemies that have like some sort of gravity about them, like the other Lord Alabaster Lord type enemies and a couple other enemy types. It's the lightest great sword in the game at 8, making it very easy to wield or even dual wield. It has the best strength scaling of all magic dealing great swords. And Alabaster Lord's pull gives you increased poise once the sword is plunged into the ground, making it rather easy to use if you can get the timing down. And you can acquire two of these in a single playthrough without needing one dropped by another player. When it comes to cons for the Alabaster Lord Sword, it's slightly shorter than most other great swords. It has the second lowest magic damage of all magic and cold infused great swords, as well as unique great swords that deal magic damage. Its pull is one of the lower damage dealing weapon skills, and you cannot change the Ash of War. And these two versions of this weapon, or two copies of this weapon, are acquired very late into the game in the Lake of Rot and the Yilo Annex Tunnel, so you won't be able to play with them until much later in the game. In summary, the Alabaster Lord Sword is in a weird place because despite having the best strength scaling and physical damage of all magic dealing great swords, it has terrible dexterity scaling and intelligence scaling and deals very little magic damage. This makes it much better suited for a pure strength build than any sort of hybrid strength intelligence build. However, the damage of this weapon is outperformed by other strength focused great swords like the Heavy Iron Great Sword and Heavy Gargoyle's Great Sword, and those weapons can be buffed, so if you're playing a strength based great sword build, this probably won't be factored in much for you. The sweet spot of damage for this weapon is 50 strength, as you only gain 76 attack rating from 50 to 99 strength, and investing points into intelligence and dexterity is not recommended, since you get very poor returns when you do this. However, despite these things, if you still want to use this weapon in your playthrough, because you can get two of them, I would suggest possibly power stancing them since they're very light. This means you won't need as much equip load in order to use them. Or using a great shield for block counter sort of build since you'll need to invest heavily in strength. And the requirements for great shields are typically high strength. And that makes it a good combo for that as well. Moving along to our next great sword, which is Ordovus's great sword. This weapon also shares the default moveset of many other great swords and deals both physical and holy damage. It's one of the heaviest great swords in Elden Ring, weighing 12 and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it has the highest attack rating of all heavy infused greatswords, about 25% of which is holy damage. Ordovus's Vortex, the weapon skill, is very high damaging and has an AoE, and it's not hard to pull off most of the time due to the poise it provides. Ordovus's Vortex can be boosted with Godfrey Icon since it can be charged, allowing you to boost its damage higher than some other unique weapon skills because not all of them can be. 
The cons of this weapon are that it has rather high requirements as far as great swords are concerned. The faith scaling is absolutely terrible, meaning you won't gain much more holy damage than what you get if you have just enough to meet the faith requirements of the weapon, so I don't recommend investing in faith if you're using this weapon. It's acquired fairly far into the game at Ariza Hero's Grave near the Royal Capital, and you cannot change the Ash of War on it. Additionally, despite having A scaling at max upgrade, it actually has worse damage from scaling than all other B scaling heavy infused greatswords. And finally, it's a poor weapon in NG plus and beyond due to scaling issues, and even though it deals an incredible amount of damage in NG, that damage is going to taper off as you go further and further into NG pluses, because there's really no way to increase the damage very high after that first playthrough. In summary, Ordovus' greatsword is a fantastic greatsword to use if you're playing a strength-based build, but points into faith barely benefit this weapon's attack rating, making it far less useful than it would appear to strength-based builds. However, if you're using the Clawmark Seal, you can still use incantations effectively, since it gains scaling from both strength and faith. The sweet spot for damage with this sword is about 50 strength and 25 faith. You only gain about 100 attack rating from 50 to 99 strength, and faith scaling is poor in general past 20. However, 25 faith will allow you to use Golden Vow, which is one of the best buffs in the game, so I recommend getting that high if you're going to use this weapon. If you're going to use this weapon, I recommend leading into the weapon skill or Dovis's Vortex, as it is extremely strong, and either two-handing it or using a Great Shield with it. Next up, we have the Inseparable Sword. This sword shares a unique two-handed R1 moveset with the Knight's Great Sword and Banish Knight's Great Sword, and deals both physical and holy damage. It has an average weight for a Great Sword and Elden Ring, weighing 10, and requires some points in Strength, Dexterity, and Faith in order to use. Some of the pros of this weapon are that it deals plus 20% damage to undead type enemies and prevents skeletons from reviving even when unbuffed. It has the second highest holy damage of all sacred infused or unique greatswords behind the Golden Order greatsword, but only at very high faith, and otherwise it's outperformed by the Sacred Iron greatsword by a tiny amount. Sacred Blade, when used, actually boosts the holy damage of this weapon over and above all other greatswords that deal holy damage at very high faith. At 80 faith, it has the highest attack rating of all holy damage dealing greatswords if you've not invested in strength or dexterity much. And over 50% of this damage is holy. Some of the cons are that it has one of the lowest physical damage dealing greatswords that also deal holy damage. You cannot change the Ash of War on this weapon. It's acquired very late into the game and can be missed in the Prince of Death's Throne. It has higher stat requirements than many greatswords. And it also has poor strength and dexterity scaling compared to some other holy damage dealing great swords. And the holy damage in general is not a great damage type late in the game, as many of the bosses in the game tend to resist it. Conclusion: The inseparable sword is mostly unremarkable. Not only is it easy to miss getting, but the sacred iron great sword outperforms it in damage most of the game, and you can use many different ashes of war on the iron great sword. Additionally, sacred blade is a much better early game ash of war than late game making it mostly irrelevant by the point you acquired this weapon. However, its innate ability to prevent the resurrection of undead and bonus damage against them is nice for some areas of the game. Only use this weapon over the Sacred Iron Greatsword if you intend to push your faith to 80 or higher, or if you want the bonuses for a specific section of undead enemies, or you cannot be bothered to farm the Iron Greatsword. Because of the poor dexterity and strength scaling of this weapon, it'll peak near the end of your first playthrough and will just continue to drop off in effectiveness from that point onward, making it not ideal for NG Plus and beyond. But if you insist on using this greatsword, I would pair it with a Sacred Iron Greatsword for jump attack playstyle, or use it with something like the Erd Tree Seal and make a build that can also cast incantations effectively. Next up, we come to the Gargoyle's Black Blade, and this shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals both physical and holy damage. It's a heavier greatsword in Elden Ring, weighing 11.5, and requires some points in Strength, Dexterity, and Faith in order to wield. Some pros about this weapon are that it has the highest attack rating of holy damage dealing greatswords infused and unique, at 50 Faith and 50 Strength. At minimum requirements and max upgrade, it has 695 attack rating, which is extremely high. Corpse Wax Cutter deals 100% holy damage, allowing you to boost it with the Sacred Scorpion Charm and Holy Shrouding Crack tier more effectively, than some other weapon skills. Corpse Wax Cutter can one-shot most regular enemies from decent range if set up properly. Some of the cons of this weapon are that it has poor scaling that makes it much better earlier on in the game than later, even though it's still strong late game. You cannot change the Ash of War on this weapon. The weapon skill Corpse Wax Cutter deals less damage than Taker's Flame, which is very similar and found on the Blasphemous Blade, 
and that also heals you when this one does not. Corpse Wax Cutter is expensive FP-wise for the damage that it deals. It can also be difficult to acquire early on since you must defeat the Blackblade Kindred boss in Kaelid in order to receive it, and that can be kind of hard to do for lower level players. Conclusion Gargoyle's Blackblade does exceptional damage for very little stat investment, making it stronger early on in the game when you're much lower level and where enemies are much less resistant to holy damage. Later on in the game, you won't gain much damage from your investment, and enemy resistances to holy are the worst on some of the toughest bosses in Elden Ring. If you manage to begin the game as a Confessor, you could use this weapon as early as level 21 if you could defeat the Blackblade Kindred, making you an absolute beast in lower level content or PvP. If you intend to reach higher levels with it, you'd ideally aim for about 50 Strength and 50 Faith, which will still put you ahead of every other Holy Damage Greatsword and Total Attack rating, and actually even more damage than the Blasphemous Blade if you don't put any points into Dexterity. What's really great about the Gargoyle's Black Blade is that you can use this weapon in any of the three playstyles I mentioned at the beginning of the video because of its ideal stat spread. I used it in my Blasphemous Herald build, for example, which focused on power stance jump attacks and weapon skills, but you could also spell cast with the Claw Mark Seal effectively or use a Great Shield and one-handed if you want to. Next up is the Sword of Milos. Sword of Milos shares a unique R2 with the Death's Poker and deals totally physical damage. It has an average weight for a Great Sword in Elden Ring weighing 10, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. The pros of Sword of Milos are that it restores 5 FP per kill while held in either hand. It's one of three great swords that applies bleed buildup with each hit. It has very good quality scaling, making it one of the best quality scaling great swords in Elden Ring, tied with Banished Knight's great sword, but behind Death's Poker and Blasphemous Blade. Quality scaling allows it to be more viable in NG Plus playthroughs. You can buff your own damage with Shrika Milos while also debuffing enemies, and the ability has decent poise at the same time. It does 100% physical damage, which is usually less resisted than elemental damage types. And finally, Roar Medallion buffs R2 attacks while under the effects of Shriek of Milos. Some cons of this weapon are that the personal damage buff has a rather short duration at 20 seconds. You cannot change the Ash of War of this weapon, nor can you buff it with Grease or Spells, unlike the Banished Knight's Greatsword. It's also acquired fairly late into the game by defeating Dung Eater, so you're not going to be using this for a huge chunk of the game. In summary, unless you build for high poise in order to use the buffed R2 combo without interruption, this greatsword seems meant to be paired with another greatsword for jump attack combos, ideally one that also has bleed on it. The FP recovery per kill alone makes it a solid choice for an offhand in this style, using another greatsword in the main hand that has a more effective weapon skill. Shriek of Milos can be difficult to use, but is extremely powerful when executed as it not only adds 85 points of physical damage for 20 seconds, but also debuffs enemies, reducing their resistances by 15% for 30 seconds. The sweet spot for stat spread seems to be around 55 strength and 55 dexterity, but because this greatsword has quality scaling, it will remain effective at much higher stats than many other greatswords. Next we have the Marais Executioner's Sword. The Marais Executioner's Sword has a unique R2 that attacks vertically instead of horizontally, and deals both physical and magic damage. It's one of the heavier greatswords in Elden Ring, weighing 11.5, and requires some points into Strength, Dexterity, and Arcane in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that Aochade's Dancing Blade is a fantastic weapon skill that can absolutely melt enemies and bosses very quickly. Aochade's Dancing Blade can be buffed by Godfrey Icon, Wing Sword Insignia, Rotten Wing Sword Insignia, and Millicent's Prosthesis easily, really cranking its damage. It also has decent scaling that makes it more akin to a quality build, though one stat is arcane instead of dexterity. When it comes to cons, it has the third lowest magic damage of any great sword that deals magic damage, including cold infusions. Strength and arcane have very little synergy outside of this weapon, making it difficult to hybrid this weapon into a caster melee build. It isn't found until much later in the game by defeating Elmer of the Briar at the top of the Shaded Castle. And lastly, it has rather high stat requirements for a great sword. In summary, the Marais Executioner's Sword is in the middle of the pack in terms of overall attack rating for magic damage dealing great swords. Since it deals predominantly physical damage, it doesn't take as good advantage of talismans and buffs that increase magic damage, unlike many other great swords that deal magic damage. Since there isn't much synergy between Strength and Arcane, it's difficult to use this weapon and hybrid it into some sort of caster that uses the Dragon Communion Seal. This is because you'd also need points in Faith to be able to cast incantations, which would mean spreading points between Strength, Arcane, Faith, Mind, and Vigor minimally, and that's not including Endurance if you want to have a higher equip load. 
The main reason to use Murray Executioner's sword, in my opinion, is its weapon skill, Aochade's Dancing Blade, that can often one or two shot most enemies and even some bosses. Because each rotation of the skill counts as a hit, talismans like Winged Sword Insignia increase its damage with each rotation, resulting in huge damage numbers. And it can also be charged, which means that it can make use of Godfrey Icon, which isn't typical of weapon skills. Either play this weapon two-handed or one-handed with a shield for best results. You should aim for 50 Strength and 50 Arcane in order to get the most from this weapon. And note that it's still okay scaling past this point in Strength, making it more viable for successive playthroughs than many other weapons. Next up is Death's Poker. Death's Poker shares a unique R2 with the Sword of Milos and deals physical and magic damage. It's extremely lightweight for a great sword in Elden Ring, weighing 8.5, and requires some points in Strength, Dexterity, and Intelligence in order to wield. The pros of Death's Poker are that it builds Frostbite with every hit, as well as its weapon skill. It has rather low requirements for a unique greatsword. It has the third highest physical damage of all magic damage dealing greatswords behind Alabaster Lord's Sword and Moray Executioner's Sword. It has the second highest potential attack rating of all quality scaling greatswords if you factor in intelligence scaling. It can be acquired somewhat early on in the game as far as greatswords are concerned. Ghost Flame Ignition is one of the best greatsword weapon skills in the game, and Ghost Flame Ignition deals 100% magic damage, allowing you to boost its damage significantly with things like Magic Scorpion Charm, Magic Shrouding Crack Tear, and Terra Magica. As far as its cons, it has the lowest magic damage of all magic damage dealing greatswords. Ghost Flame Ignition, its weapon skill scales with intelligence and deals 100% magic damage, but the weapon has terrible intelligence scaling. Conclusion For such a lightweight greatsword, Death's Poker packs a serious punch, not only in normal attack rating, but also with its weapon skill, Ghost Flame Ignition. It's a shame not more of its attack power was magic damage, since it's highly likely you'll use effects that boost magic damage with this weapon, and its regular attacks will not take much advantage of them. Ideally, you'd put 50 points into Strength and 50 into Dexterity when using this weapon in order to get the most damage out of it, but 20 points in Intelligence are also recommended in order to use Terra Magica. This spell boosts magic damage by 35% while standing inside it, which will only amplify Ghost Flame Ignition even further. I'd suggest playing with this weapon with a shield, leaning into Ghost Flame Ignition when you can, or dual wielding great swords utilizing jump attacks with this weapon in your main hand for easy Ghost Flame usage. Perhaps pairing it with something like Sword of Milos or another weapon that deals magic damage. The next great sword we're going to take a look at is Health and Steeple. Health and Steeple shares the default moveset of many other great swords and deals both physical and magic damage. It's one of the heavier great swords in Elden Ring, weighing 11.5, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and intelligence in order to wield. This weapon has the highest total attack rating of all magic damage dealing great swords and can boost its damage even higher with its weapon skill. Ruinous Ghost Flame has a rather fast cast speed and makes attacks inflict frostbite. It's better than many great swords in NG Plus and beyond due to decent strength and intelligence scaling. When it comes to cons, one of them is that its intelligence scaling is not as good as Dark Moon Greatsword or many other magic infused greatswords. The duration of Ruinous Ghost Flame is rather short at only 30 seconds. You cannot change the Ash of War on this weapon, and it's found extremely late into the game. In summary, Health and Steeple has exceptional attack rating and has a nearly perfect split in terms of physical and magic damage if strength and intelligence are equal. However, it has average intelligence scaling compared to other magic damage dealing greatswords, and there are better options if you plan to go past 50 intelligence, including Dark Moon Greatsword, Gargoyle's Magic Sword, Magic Iron Greatsword, and Magic Bastard Sword. The ideal stats read for this weapon is around 50 Strength and 50 Intelligence, which is where the weapon shines against any other greatsword with the same stat spread. Going much above this yields diminishing returns. Health and Steeple excels at dealing damage with regular attacks more than anything due to its high base damage, decent Strength and Intelligence scaling, and because it can buff itself further increasing its damage and adding Frostbite buildup to the weapon. It doesn't have an offensive weapon skill, and because other greatswords will outperform it if you take the Spellblade route of increasing Intelligence, Health and Steeple is ideal in a dual wheel jump attack setup, or potentially with a one hand and shield setup. You'll have to rebuff this weapon often, so make sure to keep it in your main hand. Next up is the infamous Blasphemous Blade. The Blasphemous Blade shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals both physical and fire damage. It's the heaviest greatsword in Elden Ring, weighing 13.5, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. The pros of this weapon, of which there are many, are that it has the highest potential attack rating of all Faith Scaling Greatswords if you place points into Faith, Strength, and Dexterity. It's one of the most powerful weapon skills in the game in Taker's Flame, which not only does incredible damage, but also heals on hit for 10% of your max HP plus 150 HP. 
It also heals 4% of your max HP and plus 40 HP per kill as long as the weapon is in either hand. Taker's Flame does pure fire damage, making it easily buffed with things like Fire Scorpion Charm and Flame Shrouded Cracked Tear. And lastly, since the weapon does both physical and fire damage on regular attacks, it benefits doubly from Flame Grant Me Strength. Some cons are that Taker's Flame is very expensive at 30 FP. Taker's Flame only scales with Faith, though Blasphemous Blade actually has modest Faith scaling. It has high requirements for a great sword, and it is found a good ways into the game, though not as far as some other great swords. And lastly, it's extremely heavy for a great sword. Conclusion. Blasphemous Blade is one of the strongest weapons in Elden Ring, not only because Taker's Flame hits extremely hard when set up properly, but also because it can hit multiple enemies at a good distance and heals you for each one struck and each one kill. If you're using the Blasphemous Blade, then you should be using Taker's Flame often, particularly during boss encounters, where you're wasting three quarters of the potential of this weapon. Despite appearances, Blasphemous Blade actually scales better with Dexterity and Strength than it does Faith, making it a poor weapon choice for a Spellblade sort of build and more suited for a sword and board playstyle or dual great swords. There are better great swords for the High Faith route, and Taker's Flame is a far better use of FP than spells if you're using Blasphemous Blade anyhow. The ideal stat spread for this build would be somewhere around 50 Strength, 50 Dexterity, and 50 Faith. This is hard to do in a single playthrough, but that's one of the reasons this is such a strong weapon. It will continue to get stronger in NG+, making it viable for multiple playthroughs. Next up is the legendary Darkmoon Greatsword. The Darkmoon Greatsword has a unique R2 and deals physical and magic damage. It has an average weight for a Greatsword and Elden Ring weighing 10, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and a lot of points in intelligence in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it causes frost buildup on attacks, and has the highest magic damage of all magic damage Greatswords at 80 intelligence, and second highest overall attack rating at 80 intelligence, with only minimum requirements into Strength and Dexterity behind the Magic Iron Greatsword. Moonlight Greatsword has good range and high stagger when charged. Moonlight Greatsword deals 100% magic damage, allowing it to be enhanced by Magic Scorpion Charm, Terra Magica, and Magic Crowding Cracked Tear substantially. The cons of this weapon are that it has extremely high requirements to wield and it's located very far into the game. Additionally, it has to be buffed to be used efficiently every 60 seconds, which can be kind of annoying. In summary, the Darkmoon Greatsword is one of the best two Greatswords in Elden Ring if you plan to make a Spellblade build. Not only does it deal solid damage at high intelligence levels, but intelligence directly affects the damage of Moonlight Greatsword's waves while also increasing your sorcery scaling. And because Moonlight Greatsword's waves are pure magic damage, they benefit directly from things I mentioned previously that most intelligence mage would use anyway, like Magic Scorpion Charm. One of the best things about Moonlight Greatsword is its ability to stagger enemies at a distance where you are less likely to get hit if you're using charged R2s, and if you're a Spellblade you can combine this with Great Blade Phalanx for even faster stagger buildup. The best way to play this build is no doubt in some build that uses sorcery since not every build will benefit from such high intelligence. The Dark Moon Greatsword has poor strength and dexterity scaling, and the Waves of Moonlight Greatsword does not benefit from these stats either. Grab Carrion Regal Scepter and go to town. The last of the unique greatswords is the Sacred Relic Sword. The Sacred Relic Sword shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals both physical and holy damage. It's one of the heavier greatswords in Elden Ring, weighing 11, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. Some pros of this weapon are that Wave of Gold is an absolutely devastating weapon skilled and arguably one of the best in the game. Wave of Gold deals 100% holy damage, allowing it to be increased significantly with things like Sacred Scorpion Charm, and Holy Shroud and Crack Tier. And it also has the highest attack rating of all keen scaling greatswords. The cons of this weapon are that it is found at the end of the game by defeating Elden Beast, making this an NG plus weapon. It has average faith scaling, but Wave of Gold's damage is increased with points into faith, not dexterity or strength. It has less than average strength scaling, meaning that you don't gain much damage when two handing it. It does the second lowest holy damage of all holy damage dealing greatswords behind Ordovus's greatsword. It has lower physical damage than all other keen scaling greatswords. Wave of Gold does not prevent undead resurrection, though it really should. And lastly, it has high stat requirements for a greatsword. Conclusion, Sacred Relic Sword, while extremely powerful because of its weapon skill, Wave of Gold is otherwise unremarkable. You cannot even acquire this weapon until you defeat Elden Beast, meaning that you'll likely only use this weapon in NG Plus and beyond, unless you skip lots of optional content on the way that you planned on doing later. You'd ideally use this weapon with about 55 dexterity and 50 faith in order to get your best bang for your buck, 
increasing your strength and NG plus to further boost damage. Because you ideally wouldn't have that much strength, your damage when two-handing this weapon won't increase much, making this a much better weapon to be one-handed in some sort of dual greatsword setup. Again, low strength initially means that you likely won't use a great shield either. Sword of Milos or Blasphemous Blade make good counterparts for a dual wield setup not only because of the passive FP or passive HP they provide, but also because they have similar scaling. Moving along to our non-unique great swords, the first one is the Bastard Sword. The Bastard Sword shares the default moveset of many other great swords and deals physical damage. It's one of the lightest great swords in Elden Ring weighing 9 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. Some pros of this weapon are that it can be acquired very early on in the game from the Nomadic Merchant on the eastern side of Weaving Peninsula. It has a very low stat requirement and can be even two-handed with 11 strength. It can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War and has good strength scaling when using heavy, cold, poison, or blood infusions. Its cons are that it's in the middle of the pack in nearly every scenario in terms of infusions. Conclusion the biggest plus points of this weapon are that you can acquire it early on and it will perform in the upper middle of the pack no matter what build you try to create with it, giving it a lot of versatility. If you've already upgraded this weapon and are short on smithing stones, then I suggest continuing to use it, but if you're working on a specialized build and haven't even acquired one yet, I suggest looking at better alternatives. Next up we have the Claymore. The Claymore has a unique R2 thrust and rolling R1 thrust and deals physical damage. It's one of the lightest great swords in Elden Ring Wang 9 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. When it comes to the pros for the Claymore, it can be acquired early on in the game from a chest in Castle Morn. It has very low stat requirements and can even be two-handed with 11 strength. It can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. Lion's Claw is an excellent Ash of War that you won't be able to get until a ways further into the game. Its unique Thrust R2 has very good reach, allowing you to hit enemies you might otherwise miss. The cons of this greatsword are that its damage is in the middle of the pack in nearly every scenario. Conclusion Really, the only reason to use this greatsword over others is its unique R2 that allows you to catch enemies at longer ranges or because of the Ash of War Lion's Claw, which would normally take much longer to acquire. Consider using the Axe and Spear Talismans with this weapon to take full advantage of charged R2 thrusts. Next up is the Iron Greatsword. The Iron Greatsword shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals physical damage. It is one of the heaviest greatswords in Elden Ring Wang 12, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. Some pros of this weapon are that it has higher base physical damage than every other greatsword in Elden Ring. It's near the top of the pack in every possible infusion, making it a great choice if you're unsure exactly which greatsword to use, or if you want to try a variety of builds but don't want to farm a lot of upgrade materials. It has very low stat requirements and can be even two-handed with 12 strength. It can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. The downsides of this weapon are that it's not found until much further into the game in the Lendal Royal Capital or even further at Mikla's Halig Tree. And it can also take a very long time to farm, especially if you want two of them. Summary, the Iron Greatsword is the best non-unique greatsword in Elden Ring, outperforming nearly every other non-unique greatsword in just about every infusion possible, and in some cases unique greatswords as well. You cannot acquire it until you reach the royal capital and can farm the misbegotten enemies there, which can be a serious pain in the butt to do, because there are only two, and neither are near a side of grace. However, if you manage to farm one, you'll have a fantastic offhand greatsword for just about any dual greatsword setup, or a great mainhand greatsword if you decide to lean into some of the strong Ashes of War and Elden Ring like Flame of the Red Mains or Lion's Claw. Next up is the Lord Sworn's Greatsword. The Lord Sworn's Greatsword shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals physical damage. It's one of the lightest greatswords in Elden Ring Wang 9 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it's the earliest attainable greatsword found in the Gatefront Ruins in a chest. It has higher critical rating than nearly every other greatsword in the game. It has very low stat requirements and can be even two-handed with 11 strength. And it can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. Its cons are that it is in the bottom middle of the pack in nearly every infusion. Conclusion, the best reason to use the Lord Sworn's Greatsword is because you can do so from the earliest moments of the game. However, it doesn't take but an hour to find either the Claymore or Bastard Sword naturally, and within minutes if you already know their location. Even though this weapon has higher critical than every other Greatsword except the Sacred Relic Sword, its overall damage is low enough that you'd still do more damage from critical hits with other Greatswords. Next up is the Knight's Greatsword. Knight's Greatsword shares a unique two-handed R1 moveset with the Banished Knight's Greatsword and the Inseparable Sword and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a Greatsword in Elden Ring weighing 10 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. 
The pros of this weapon are that it can be acquired quite early in the game from Godric Knights and Limgrave, Mausoleum Knights, or Cuckoo Knights, and Lernia of the Lakes. It has one of the highest two attack rating greatswords you can get relatively early in the game, with a bit of farming, with a Banished Knight's greatsword being the other. It has very low stat requirements and can be two-handed with 11 strength. And lastly, it can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. The cons of this weapon are that it might take a while to farm one or longer if you want to, and also that it is outperformed by the Banished Knight's Greatsword in just about every case, so there's not really a lot of point in farming this weapon if you can farm that one instead. Conclusion The Knight's Greatsword is the strongest early game greatsword that you can acquire without defeating a single boss. If you're looking for low-level cooperation or just want the highest attack rating you can get on a greatsword as quickly as possible, then the Knight's Greatsword is the one for you. Next up is the Banished Knight's Greatsword. The Banished Knight's Greatsword shares a unique two-handed R1 moveset with the Knight's Greatsword, as we just mentioned, and the Inseparable Sword, and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a Greatsword in Elden Ring, weighing 10, and requires some points in Strength and Dexterity in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it drops relatively early on in Elden Ring from Banished Knights wielding them. It is also one of the two highest attack rate and greatswords you can get early on in the game, with a bit of farming, with the Knight's Greatsword being the other. It has very low stat requirements, and can even be two-handed with 12 strength. It can also be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. The downsides are that it can take a while to farm, particularly if you want two of them. Summary The Banished Knight's Greatsword is the king of early game greatswords, and is worth farming if you want to be as strong as you possibly can early on. However, if you've already used most of your upgrade materials on another great sword like the Bastard Sword or Claymore, and you haven't unlocked ways to purchase more, it's probably not worth doing since you can replace it with an Iron Great Sword for even more damage later on. Next up is the Forked Great Sword. The Forked Great Sword shares the default moveset of many other great swords and deals physical damage. It's one of the lightest great swords in Elden Ring Wang 9 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it is one of three great swords that builds up bleed with each hit. It can be found sooner than the Flamberge since it drops from imp enemies that wield it. It's great for status effect oriented builds since you can add frostbite or poison to it as well. You can also get two in a single playthrough without needing one drop from another player. The cons of this weapon are that it has a relatively low attack rating compared to other great swords. It deals less damage than the Flamberge in nearly every case and that also sets bleeding. And it can also be very difficult to farm, especially if you want to. Conclusion Even though the Forked Greatsword has a lower attack rating than most other Greatswords, the fact that you can trigger hemorrhage with it makes it much more deadly than it would first appear. However, it is more effective in boss encounters where you are more likely to trigger hemorrhage before your target outright dies than it is out in the lands between where you can kill most things in one or two hits anyway. If you can be bothered to farm one, then you should consider farming a second one or pairing it with a Flamberge for a jump attack playstyle that also applies Hemorrhage and possibly Frostbite or Poison as well. Next up is the Flamberge. The Flamberge shares the default moveset of many other Greatswords and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a Greatsword in Elden Ring Wang 10 and requires some points in Strength and Dexterity in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it's one of three Greatswords that builds up bleed with each hit. And it can be found earlier than the vast majority of greatswords located inside Redmain Castle. And it's also great for status effect oriented builds since you can add frostbite or poison to it as well. And it has the best scaling of all keen infused greatswords. The downside of this weapon is that it has lower attack rating than just about all other greatswords. Summary Fantastic keen scaling lends itself well to a dexterity focused build, but the Flamberge also works well in status effect oriented builds because it can also add frostbite or poison depending on the infusion. And much like the Forked Greatsword, the lower attack rating is often outweighed by the hemorrhage this weapon can apply, particularly in boss encounters. Either dual wield greatswords for jump attacks, or lean into an Ash of War that hits multiple times like Double Slash, Spinning Slash, Repeating Thrust, or Blood Tax for best results. And lastly, we come to the Gargoyle's Greatsword. The Gargoyle's Greatsword shares the default moveset of many other greatswords and deals physical damage. It's one of the heavier greatswords in Elden Ring weighing 11.5 and requires some points in Strength and Dexterity in order to wield. The pros of this weapon are that it has some of the best scaling among greatswords. It has very low stat requirements and can even be two-handed with 12 strength. It can be outfitted with many different Ashes of War. The downsides of this weapon are that it takes a long time to acquire because you have to defeat the Valiant Gargoyles in Siofra Aqueduct, and it is also outperformed by the Iron Greatsword in nearly every case. Conclusion The Gargoyles Greatsword is a very strong greatsword, but is outperformed by the Iron Greatsword in nearly every instance because of its higher base damage. It's a great alternative to it if you cannot be bothered to farm the Iron Greatsword, but there really isn't much other reason to use it other than appearance. 
If you intend to use the Gargoyle's Greatsword, lean into its superior scaling and make sure to crank your damage scaling attributes high to take full advantage of it, which will often close the gap or surpass other similar Greatswords in terms of attack rating at higher attribute ranges. Well, that wraps up our Greatswords video, and this is the first of our new series that's showcasing all the different weapons in the game by comparing them against each other in the same weapon categories and giving you valuable information to help you decide which ones will fit your playstyle the best. Feel free to leave in the comments anything that I missed as well. There's a lot of data about these weapons and it's sometimes hard to get it all into one video. So if I missed anything, make sure you let people know in the comments below. So what did you guys think of the Great Swords video? Are you guys using Great Swords in your playthrough? Do you think they are the best weapon in the game? Which ones are you using? Let us know in the comments below.